Hello biology and welcome back to chapter 16. In this one we're talking about population genetics and the process of speciation. We're kind of going to jump into uh, kind of the finer details of how evolution happens on the day-to-day -day scale. Alright, so the first thing we're going to talk about is population genetics. This is the study of evolution from the uh, genetic point of view. So we're looking at the uh, DNA of organisms, and we're looking at how that has progressed over time, what that allows organisms to do. Uh, this kind of evolution is called microevolution, or it's the change in the collective genetic material in a population. Uh, think of this as a change in the allele frequency in a population. So if a population of white flowers mutates and has a red gene and then that gene starts to become more and more popular and the flowers move to be more and more red that is what microevolution looks like is these flowers slowly changing from a white one to now a red one or quickly depending on how fast that gene spreads and how uh, fit it is in organisms when we talk about population genetics we do a little bit of statistics uh i don't need you to know the super super nitty-gritty statistics of this yet but what i do need to know is what a bell curve looks like this is a bell curve here and in organisms we have different observable traits it could be size this is really small organisms and this is really large organisms and this is somewhere in the middle uh, so what these statistics basically say is that at most of the time we're expecting to see organisms have this average amount of traits and when they don't have that average amount of traits there is selection that's working on them to move them into either being larger, being smaller, or some other uh, configuration. And we'll talk about what that looks like. All right, so some causes of variation. Remember that uh, things that cause traits are things like environmental factors, such as the amount of food available to an object, or heredity, the genes that are passed down from your parents. Here's a Punnett square showing different dog, dog color, dog fur color there for labs. But uh, because there's so much variation and there's other factors at play, par even in parents can have children that look very much different from one another. So even though they're very closely related, they have very different unique traits. So what causes genes to mutate? There are three ways for them to mutate, excuse me, for them to vary. And the first is mutation. This is a random change. In a gene that is passed on to offspring, this is what this uh, kind of meme is here. And when he looked at his strand the next morning, one of the bases was gone. I'm talking about mutation, of course. I, I, I assume that a DNA would find that a scary story. Our second type of way for genes to vary is the recombination, which is the reshuffling of genes in a diploid individual. And then this happens during meiosis, so that means that when you uh, give genes to your offspring, it is a random assortment of genes. They don't aren't the exact same genes that you have. They are a combination of different uh, randomly assorted genes. And the last one here is the random pairing of gametes occurs because organisms produce large amount of gametes with different traits. Uh, once again, this is why you and your siblings look very much different. You each came from individual gametes that fused together to form uh, individual uh, organisms. When we talk about genetics, we'll talk about the gene pool. And the gene pool is, a to is the total genetic information available in a population. Now, if you know all of the alleles in a population, you can see how common a certain trait is. So in this population, there's lots of green frogs, there's very few purple frogs, and there's only one red frog. If you look at the gene pool here, which kind of is just this assortment of all these kind of nice graphically organized, you can see that there is mostly green alleles inside of this uh, pool. So we can find something called the allele frequency. We take a percentage uh, by dividing the number of, of a certain allele, looking at either big A, little a, and then by the total numbers of alleles in a population. So for our example here, if there is six uh, alleles here of A, and four of the little a, what is the frequency of each? Well, for the big one, it would be six out of 10, or 60% or 0 0.6. And for little a, little a, it equals four out of 10, which would be 0 0.4. So 
So we can predict phenotypes. Uh, phenotypes can change from generation to generation, even if the genotype stays the same. So even though we have uh, incomplete dominance here, where the big R or big A, big A equals red, this one equals pink, and this one equals white, we're going to jump into how to find the phenotype frequency of these. So phenotype frequency is equal to the number of individuals with a particular phenotype. Sorry, I, uh, I get a little excited there. Number of uh, individuals with a particular phenotype divided by the total number of individuals in a population. If you want to, this is a special case, you might need to on an assignment or something. When dealing with the percentages and odds, if you want to find the probability of a big R, big R pair, you would find the frequency of R times the frequency of R, and that is going to equal the frequency of what it would be to get both of those. Remember that if you're doing percentages, uh, if you remember from your math class or your math education, that we times percentages together to get both of those happening. All right, so let's do one real quick. Uh, in this first picture here, how many big R do I have? Big R equals uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve out of a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight out of sixteen, which is equal to uh, three quarters, so zero point seven five. And my little r equals 1, 2, 3, 4. 4 out of 16, so 0.25%. Now I'm going to be a little cramped for space here, but we're going to do big R. And little r equals here. Big R in this one, we have, uh, this is the second generation, so after these guys have bred. As 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 is 12 out of 16. Once again, that's 0 0.75. And then R is going to be 4 out of 16. 0 0.25. But something I want to point out and something that's interesting here is in this top one, for how many red we have, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 red, and then we'll do it here, 4 pink in this top one here. But on this bottom one, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Five red, two pink, and one white. So even though these guys have the same allele frequency, even though these numbers here are identical, uh, the actual like phenotype of this guy looks a little bit different. All right, so when you're doing these things, the frequencies have to add up to 1. So in this example here, we would take 0 0.75 for our big R. Remember to find big R, big R equals 0 0.75 times 0 0.75. Let me run the number real quick. All right, so I went ahead and ran all the numbers for us here. The uh, frequency here of big R, big R is the 0 0.75 from this chart times 0 0.75 equals 0 0.5625. So that's the probability, about 56%, that you're going to have an individual that has big R, big R. Uh, for the recessive trait here, it was the smaller number, so we times that together, and we get 0 0.0625. And then now we can use this equation here, where we take the 1 minus this 5.5625, Minus this 0 0.0625 equals the heterozygote, the big R, little r. And running all the numbers for that, 
we end up with 0 0.375. So that would be how you would do an example of these and how would you get your answer. All right, the Hardy-Weinberg genetic equilibrium. In the late 1800s, we have William Weinberg from Germany and we have Gottfried Hardy from Britain and independently, they each come together, they each have this idea that genotype frequencies in a population stay the same uh, unless they're acted on by outside forces. So unless something changes this, these guys are going to stay the same. So the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is a uh, kind of equation and an idea based on a set of factors that occur in a population that is not evolving. That is one that is not changing. All right, so the assumptions of the Hardy-Weinberg are... Uh, number one, there's no mutations. All the alleles stay the same. Number two, individuals never enter nor leave the population. Number three, the population is large, ideally really big, infinitely large. Uh, number four, individuals mate randomly. And number five, natural selection does not occur. So the Henry Weinberg is theoretical. Usually uh, real populations don't undergo the Henry Weinberg equilibrium. They are evolving. So anytime that we see uh, something that's, not, that's falling away from the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, it is in the process of evolution. So the first one here is if individuals don't mate randomly, like this guy here is random mating. He's mating with all of these. Uh, if it just changes and it's non-random, these guys are going to pass off this brown allele, this dark brown allele, much more frequently than in the random mating example, where this guy's passing one here, one there, one there. What this means is that this population will start to have more and more brown beetles, and this population will start to move that way. It will start to move towards having all brown beetles. And that is what uh, microevolution is. All right, 16.2 is the disruption of genetic equilibrium. We're going to talk about how we uh, break the Hardy-Weinberg e Hardy equation. So evolution is the change in a population thing which material over time. Another way we've talked about this is, is how population's allele frequencies change. Anytime that we don't fulfill these assumptions of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium here, evolution can occur. All right, for the first one, mutation. Uh, the first requirement is that we don't have mutations in a population. We get spontaneous mutations all the time. They happen at very low conditions. Uh, excuse me, on normal conditions, they happen very slowly, but they happen all the time. They also happen if organisms are exposed to radi radiation or chemicals or other things that mutate genes. Mutations create new genes, much like this guy here with the uh, red, very red beard. And these can affect equilibrium. Now this, this trait is in the population. There is a shift in the uh, allele frequency. Most mutations are harmful or have no effect, but the ones that do stick around uh, usually benefit an organism in some way. All right, the second thing here is that the size of the population remains constant. Uh, if individuals are moving from one population to another, this is changing the size of two populations. So immigration is like this guy, this red, this red beetle moving into this population. It's when things move inside of a population. Immigration, this red one is moving out of this population. So in this example here, we have both immigration and emigration happening at the same time. Uh, animals. They go through gene flow a lot. This is not an uncommon thing for them. Things like baboons here live in groups. These groups are called troops. Usually there's 10 to 200 members. The young males are usually cast out of the group while the females stay. So the young males are immigrating out of the group and then they'll immigrate into another group or make their own group. So these guys will leave, make their own group, uh, and these genes will move from population to population. So inflow is just the process of genes moving from one population to another, whether it's this beetle example, whether it's deer going over a pass. There's lots of ways we can get gene flow. Uh, dispersal of seeds, plants do gene flow all the time, things like migration, uh, all of these different things. Overpopulation pushes animals into new areas that can add for gene flow to current populations. Another phenomenon we see is called genetic drift. So the third requirement for our genetic equilibrium, our Hardy-Weinberg, is the presence of a large population. In genetic drift, we have this phenomenon by which allele populations change randomly 
in a population. So in this guy, in here, the green ones aren't being hunted. They're not more likely to be stepped on. This was just a random event that happened. And now the genetics are much different in this population. Instead of having lots of these green alleles, we now have one individual with that. So in small populations, especially the failure of one individual to reproduce can significantly disrupt this allele frequency. Now, instead of having uh, a couple greens in here, we have just one. So the allele frequency has went way down. However, uh, if this guy just turned out to be a very attractive beetle and all he was able to mate successfully and reproduce a lot of times, this could very quickly change in his population, in his allele population could be very, uh, very quickly changed to be one of the more dominant ones in a population. Uh, Non-random mating. So the first, the fourth requirement of the Hardy-Weinberg is, is random mating without regard to genetic makeup. Most species do not mate randomly. They have some kind of mating call, breed, uh, courtship dance, uh, something where the female is choosing the male or the male is choosing the female. Most of the time, it's the female choosing the male. So, also, mate selection is often influenced by genetic proximity. Uh, this can result in mating with some degree of kinship. We talked about like the baboons. If we have in related individuals who are mating, it amplifies certain traits and can create offspring with disorders, especially those that are found in recessive genes. So things like golden retrievers here uh, in this picture, they are s incredibly susceptible to leukemia. It's like German shepherds are really susceptible to having bad hips. These are, uh, because they have non-randomly mated, excuse me, uh, the recessive genes have stacked up inside of these individuals. Another, uh, Non-random mating example is individuals may select a trait that has similar traits to their own. Uh, the selection of trait of mate based on similarity of traits is called assortative mating. Eating. So these brown beetles like other brown beetles, and they make more brown beetles. What this does is it affects which alleles will be combined within individuals, but not does not affect the overall allele frequencies within a population. Uh, these populations can still have a healthy allele frequency. Sexual selection is another type of non-random mating. Uh, in many species, the females tend to choose the males they want based on certain characteristics or traits. In, the, in these species that do the sexual selection, the males often brightly colored, heavily plumaged, uh, very like attractive during the mating season. The downside to this is it makes them very much easier for predators to find, see, and eat. However, in order to mate, they need to be picked by a female. This means that reproductive and natural selection favors that uh, successful reproducer rather than successful survivors. So like the peacock here, the peahen is very, uh, very muted in color. She doesn't have this big plumage in the back here. What this does is this makes her much better at surviving and not getting eaten by predators so she can lay eggs and have young. The male, on the other hand, he's very brightly colored. Look at me. Uh, this works for the female, but it doesn't work on avoiding being eaten. The fifth requirement of the Hardy-Weinberg is natural selection and that it is absent in a population that's in equilibrium. Natural selection is an ongoing process. It's currently happening to a lot of species. It happens all the time, so it disrupts this genetic equilibrium. Natural selection acts on many variations of traits. I mean that certain traits become more frequent and they will shift away from this normal bell curve. So we're going to talk about the bell curve again, but in this example here with the finches, we have one that was uh, more insect eating, woodpecker eating, and seed eating. Those were split up based on the traits that were really good and that made new populations. All right, for the first type of selection, we have stabilizing selection, where individuals with the average form of a trait have the highest fitness. This means that being uh, on either end, like extremely on either end is not favored. So with robin egg size, this is a good example. The average here is four. Uh, if you have larger clutches or larger amounts, you're less likely to survive. Those eggs are less likely to survive. And if they are smaller, uh, you might not have any viable offspring. So this is kind of the middle here. So as this continues to happen over time, more and more robins will continue to have uh, four eggs instead of more or less. In disruptive selection, individuals with either extreme variation of a trait have greater fitness than those with the average. 
So this dotted line is the average uh, bell curve here. Being either a really dark moth or a really light moth means that you were able to survive better. So this is disruptive, where we're splitting it in two directions. And then we have directional selection. And this is when individuals that display a more extreme form of a trait have greater fitness than those with an average form. So uh, the peppered moths are a great example of this. However, it's important to note that this is only moving one direction. So it's not like the disruptive where it splits. It's not like the disruptive where it splits. It's like it's just moving one direction. So these guys are a good example of that. Uh, we're getting more and more of these dark colored moths, but we're not also getting them more light colored moths. All right, the formation of species. When we get new species, it's called speciation. We can uh, look at species, we can look at morphology-based species approach, we look at the internal and external structures and appearance of an organism, and then we can use this to classify animals based on what they look like. There are limitations though, especially among fossilized remains of things that are no longer around, and analogous structures. Both of these guys uh, are aquatic, both of them are mammals, but they are not very they're not as closely related as some of their other ancestors. This guy here is a whale, so he's more closely related to humpback whales. He is a humpback, excuse me, sperm whales and blue whales and right whales. And then this guy over here, the killer whale, we call him, he's actually a dolphin. So he's more closely related to the, door, the, the bottleneck dolphin and the porpoise. So even though they look very much the same, they have fins, they have flippers, uh, they aren't the same species and they aren't very closely related. This is a problem with morphology. Some more problems is one species can have different phenotypes. Each one of these dog species here is a different phenotype. They're all the same species. Uh, some other things, organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring are the same species. So our example here is dogs. They can uh, interbreed, produce fertile offspring. A horse and donkey is not an example. Uh, they make a mule, which is not the same species as either of those ones and is not cannot reproduce to form new offspring. So horses and donkeys are a new species, excuse me, different species. And that's kind of this guy's thing. He is the biological species concept, uh, kind of conceptual ideal thinker here. His name is Ernst Meyer. He's an American biologist. He defined a species as a population of organisms that can successfully interbreed that cannot interbreed with other groups. So it's like all your different species of duck would be a different species based on who they can breed with. The biological species concept has some um, downsides. It's useful for only animals that are alive today. Uh, we can't really go back and see what the woolly mammoth could have mated with. So it's not really easy to test uh, the biological species concept on him. And it's not useful for species who do not reproduce sexually, things like bacteria and fungi who produce asexually. It makes it a little bit harder for us. All right, so some isolation and speciation. So how does speciation start? How do we get these speciation events? And then another thing to think is like, what animals are likely to interbreed? So. There are two kind of ways that we can get uh, speciation going. But what happens is two parts of one interbreeding population stop breeding, and then they split to become new populations. And there's two important parts, uh, two important types of isolation that can stop this kind of interbreeding. The first, all right, in geographic isolation, this is the physical separation of members of a population. This can happen as a habitat becomes divided. At one point in time, uh, this isthmus here of Central America didn't exist. North America and South America were free-floating uh, continents that weren't connected. But as this thing popped up and arose, this pork fish here uh, got separated from a, itself and it became two different types, the Panamic pork fish and the pork fish. Other examples are like a deep canyon developing, the splitting up of Pangaea, all these are geographic isolation, where now gene flow stops spreading between these two sides of whatever geographic barrier we have. In our next one here called allopatric speciation, this happens when species arise as a result of uh, geographic isolation. So allopatric means different homelands. Whenever there is a split in these two populations, we get these uh, new, new populations and new species formed. 
It's more likely to occur in small populations because the smaller gene pool is able to change quicker. It has uh, less alleles to deal with, so these allele frequencies can change very quickly. Uh, the next way that, organ that we can get isolation is through reproductive isolation. This is when all groups of organisms become genetically isolated without being separated geographically. Uh, so reproductive isolation is barriers to successful breeding with it between population groups in the same area. This is common in disruptive selection where there's two extremes that are favored. Uh, this is the example of the horse and the donkey forming a mule. Even though they're able to make this offspring, he is not able to breed himself, so that is not a true species. There are two types of reproductive isolation. There is prezygotic and postzygotic. Prezygotic means before the zygote and it occurs before fertilization. There's no zygote formed. Uh, there could be a difference in mating calls, difference in mating seasons. They could be in different habitats, so they're not ever see each other. They could mate at different times of the year, so we have temporal isolation. Uh, they could have a different call, so it could be behavioral. It could be mechanical, as in it just doesn't work. Or it can be comedic, where the, the egg and the sperm don't fertilize. Uh, Postzygotic isolation occurs after fertilization. The, the zygote may form, but will not be born healthy or will not be able to fertilize offspring, like in the case of mules. This is called a sympatric speciation, where we get two subpopulations that become reproductively isolated within the same geographic area. Uh, these different populations might use different resources. Eventually, they become separated enough that they stop interbreeding with each other. They might use different layers of the tree canopy. One might burrow underground. One might run on top of the ground. One might be, become aquatic. There's lots of different reasons that they, they stop, uh, but these are some examples. This is how we think all of the different newts here in California formed. Uh, we think that at one point in time, they were all one population, but as California started to dry out and all of these different streams started to become isolated, we got isolated species of these newts and salamanders. All right, so the last thing, couple things we're going to talk about is the rate of speciation. Uh, speciation sometimes takes millions of years, and sometimes it happens very quickly. So for an example, for a quick one, uh, banana trees were introduced to the Hawaiian Islands only a thousand years ago. Now there are species that only eat bananas that we don't find anywhere else in the world. So somewhere uh, we got this species that arose in the last thousand years. The two different types of, of speeds here is gradualism and punctuated equilibrium. In gradualism, we have species that occur at a regular gradual rate. We have one change uh, very slowly, changing from orange to a lighter to a white or orange to a darker black. It takes a long time. Or, this is what happened for mammals, or sometimes we have sudden bursts where all of a sudden we have this orange guy, he st this one stays orange, but then all of a sudden we get both the white and the black without inner intermediate uh, forms. They just change almost just instantaneously there. And this forms a bunch of new species. And this can happen over uh, a really, really short uh, time frame. Uh, this is the conclusion of chapter 16. Hopefully you learned something. Hopefully you uh, uh, have a grasp over the Hardy-Weinberg equation and can talk about the different types of speciation and isolation. Uh, thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next one.